with artists uh, engage in the creation of more inclusive and anti-racist theater. I'm particularly excited to speak with our guest today because I've followed and admired her work for multiple decades. She may not know that, but it's true. Um, a few housekeeping items before we start. The conversation will be conducted in two parts. During the first 40 minutes or so, I'll engage in direct conversation with Lisa. Uh, during that section, we ask that you keep all your cameras turned off and mics muted. For optimal viewing, please keep your cameras on speaker view. Then after about 40 minutes, we'll open up for Q&A, at which point we welcome you to turn cameras on, remain muted until you speak. And for that part, we invite you to shift to gallery view. Um, uh, please note the conversation is being recorded. The chat is being monitored by our program manager, Nick Horner. Feel free to post questions and or comments there as, as well in the chat. Um, and finally, let us remember to remain respectful, open, and growth-centered as a community, even as we engage with sensitive and or challenging subjects. At the place George Mason University occupies, we give greetings and thanksgivings to the Doag ancestors, the enslaved and rightfully freed African Americans, and the Manahoic, the Rappahannock, Pamunkey, Matapani, Upper Matapani, Chickahominy, Eastern Chickahominy, Nansmoon, Monacan, Potawomac, Nataway, and Piscataway tribes who lovingly stewarded these lands past, present, and future. I invite you to acknowledge the indigenous stewards of the land wherever you are by writing their names in the chat. Uh, by way of introduction, I'm going to read uh, an abridged biography for Lisa. Lisa Crone has been creating and performing theater since moving to New York City from Michigan in 1984 and finding a home at the Wow Cafe, a lesbian theater collective in the center of that era's rich East Village performance scene. She's best known for writing the book and lyrics for the musical Fun Home with music by composer Janine Tesori, which won five 2015 Tony Awards, including Best Book, Score, and Musical, and was a finalist for the Pulitzer Prize. Lisa's other plays include In the Wake, Well, and the Obie Award-winning 2.5-Minute Ride. As an actor, she received a Tony nomination for her performance in Well and a Lortel Award for her turn in the Foundry Theater's acclaimed production of Good Person of Sejuan. She is the recipient of Guggenheim, Sundance, and McDowell Fellowships, a Doris Duke Performing Art Artist Award, a Cal Arts Alpert Award, a Helen Merrill Award, the Clevin Prize for Libretto Writing, and grants from Creative Capital and the New York Film Academy. Lisa is a founding member of the OB and Bessie award-winning collaborative theater company, The Five Lesbian Brothers, and has served as an elected member of the National Council of the Dramatist Guild of America since 2010. She is very proud to be part of a theater-based giving circle called Save Our States that raises money as a community every election cycle to support the state's project, an organization working successfully to shift the balance of power in state legislatures. Please join me in welcoming the incomparable Lisa Crone to the virtual stage. Welcome, welcome, my friend. It is beyond a pleasure. <laughs> Thank you. It's, um, it's really great to be here. And I have been a fan of Jolo's work also for an equal amount of time. Uh, we really, I feel like we, uh, well, we're real con it's contemporaries. I think we really, you yeah. know, yeah. Five Lesbian Brothers and the Pomo for Homos were uh, oh, yeah. really, yeah, working at the same <laughs> time, right in the, you know, similar orbits. Yes, yes. Thank you. Thank you for that. 
Um, as always, I like to start um, by asking about your background. I think all work is informed by culture, identity, history, and I'm curious about how your life experience has informed your creative practice. Could you tell us a bit about how your life has informed, grounded, and or challenged your work? Mm -hmm. um, well, uh, yeah, I was raised in Lansing, Michigan, yeah. and um, I didn't I didn't see theater really when I was a kid. I think the first time I saw an, a professional production of a play, I was at least 16 years old. Um, although before that I had seen like high school musicals that my cousins were in. Right. Um, so, you know, I, I um, you know, I, I think that theater for many, if not all of us who work in it is a vocation, you know, it comes and it gets you. Yeah. You know, it's it's like being gay in that way. You don't need to know anything about it uh, <laughs> when you're growing up uh, right. to have it come in and sort of claim you. And um, I would say that's certainly what happened for me. Um, and at the time when I, uh, you know, I sort of backed my way into a theater major at Kalamazoo College, small liberal arts college mm -hmm. uh, in Michigan where I uh, went to school. Um, you know, I was told directly that there wasn't really a place for me in the theater. That wow. there, I, I wasn't a, I wasn't a writer. I didn't become a writer for a long time. I was, you know, I, I you know, I was, a, I was a ham. I was a big, big ham, and um, I, um, but you know, I was told things like, well, you know you should either, you know, lose 30 pounds or gain, uh, you know, 80 pounds wow. because you're not a type or, you know, maybe if you can hang on until you're 40, you can get work playing somebody's mother. This I was, was also told that was in college. Yeah. Wow. I was also told, uh, you know, I don't know if this still happens, but it, there was a thing that happened where you would audition for one of the plays. And then when you didn't get cast, you would go and be told why you didn't get cast. And um, so I, you know, the head of the theater department said to me when I did get cast as sort of a neighbor lady, he said, as if this was obvious, as if this was something everybody knew, he said, well, you know, you don't convey any sexuality on stage. Wow. Um, and so, you know, uh, in a million different, and, and also, you know, at that time, the best graduate schools, which I, I will say I auditioned for some graduate schools and I was rejected by all of them. But, um, you know, the, the good programs took, uh, you know, five men and uh, ten, 10 men and five women, you right. know, and of those women, one would be an ingenue, one would be a character woman, you know, they were specific types. And that was, right. I, 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 I mean, that changed, I think, relatively recently. And the justification for it was, well, plays have yeah. more parts for men than they do for women. Yeah. So, that's uh, true. That's true. So, so produced by men. By yeah. Men. So, um, you know, I, I, I so I don't know wh what would have, uh, you know, where I would have ended up, but in my senior year in college, this woman, Lowry Marshall, came into the theater department. She since went to uh, Brown U University uh, and has. Uh, you know, been really instrumental in the, you know, uh, yeah. training uh, and trajectory of a lot of actors there. But she just has like she, this incredible ability to look at somebody and say, I see something in you. And of course, you can have a professional career. And that wasn't something that really anybody in a small Midwestern liberal arts, you know, I always joke that people yeah. were like, you know, just like, well, kid, you know, if you're lucky, you'll get a job on a cruise ship. You know, it was just like the idea of a professional career was just like not a thing. Um, and so, you know, I ended up, you know, sort of skipping ahead, ended up touring with a national in the company of this national repertory company that uh, toured for, you know, one season. And that was amazing. And then I ended up in New York and, you know, I don't know, sort of flopping around, you know. Yeah. Uh, and then I just sort of, you know, stumbled uh, into the Wow Cafe in the East Village. Okay. Mm -hmm. Where, uh, 
the Split Bridges company was performing. Okay. And I saw their play, Peggy Shaw, Demar Golan, and Lois Weaver. I saw their play, Split Bridges, which, you know, Paula Vogel always says that people have a God play, which is the play, yeah. all, every playwright has a God play, the play that they saw that ignited their theatrical imagination. And for me, Split Bridges was and remains that to me. It was, Wonderful. It, it changed. It, I mean, it was just utterly paradigm shifting. Yeah. It, it moved, it, it moved the, the, the center of gravity in the universe. For right, me. right, right. And, um, and then I just, and, you know, while I was a theater collective and I just started just hanging out there and it was very awkward and I was very afraid and, you know, eventually it became my home and it, you know, there was no professional career to be had there. Um, it was a, you know, Wendell uh, Pierce uh, uh, talks about what a living culture is, and, you know, talking about New Orleans, the difference between a living culture and a commodified culture. Yeah. And a living culture, it is, it is in the daily lives of people. It is an, ex it, there are modes of expressiveness that shape uh, everything about our days. They're how we mark our daily joys and heartbreaks are through this vehicle of ongoing rolling uh culture making not precious just like you know like a you know the 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 you know sort of easiest to access new orleans example is the second line um, right right and uh uh <laughs> And that's what WOW was. We, you know, there was there were no gatekeepers to make a show. All you had to do was work on somebody else's, uh, you know, work the box office or do right. the lights or do support work on somebody else's show. And in the next season, you could say, oh, I want three weeks or I want four weeks because I'm going to do a show with live horses on stage or whatever, yeah. some crazy yeah. thing. And they'd be like, okay, we'll put you in. And, you know, I was, you know, trained in the theater and I was like well <laughs> that person doesn't know anything about theater and you know uh yeah. uh but uh, so you know there's there's lots to say about that and the, the sort of retraining that happened there for me yeah but the wonderful but, thing is and I don't know if you can see behind me but um I have a poster of Peggy Shaw here at the menopausal gentleman it's one of my favorite shows um among many that she's done um yeah but, um for for those of us who don't know what sort of the 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 scape of Lansing, Michigan was, it was pretty much, in my understanding, and this is really from your show. Well, it was sort of an industrial town at one point. Or uh, by the time you grew up, it had become something else. So as you said, you didn't see much theater growing up, or any theater really, except the musicals that your cousin was in. Um, is that sort of an accurate depiction? Yeah, I mean, it was the state capital. Um, it is, it is yeah. the state capital. And so, um, and it was a, an auto town. Um, so, uh, okay. so there were auto factories. Yeah. Um, and there was, there was, there was, you know, there was theater there at the community college. And it, there was, for many years, there was the Boar's Head Theater. My family just didn't engage in it, but Got it. Um, uh, we just weren't oriented that way. But um, yeah, so, you know, small, a midwestern city Got capital it. city mm -hmm. and um so that's the other you know sort of going back to uh, your your question again um i mean my play well sort of tells this story of uh i mean it, it i was born in 1961 and we moved there in 1964 Mm -hmm. And um, at that, you know, that was sort of the the uh, white flight from inner city um, suburbs was happening uh, was very was very turbocharged at that time, mm -hmm. and um, you know, redlining, blockbusting, all of those forms of turning neighborhoods over. Got it. That was happening, um, and uh, my mother and I, you know, uh, talk about this in well about sort of what her background and her just sort of internal compass was uh, that made her, for whatever reasons, be like, it doesn't seem right. 
and uh, you know talk to um, you know with a bunch of other neighbors. They started a, a a neighborhood association that worked successfully to mm. stop uh, that process of uh, white flight and then disinvestment in mm. the neighborhood that I grew up in and create. A, a stable, a racially integrated neighborhood. Yeah. Um, so that was, uh, I mean, that was the it really the main main event of my, yeah. of my yeah. childhood. Yeah. And I see a thread of your mother's social justice compass in your work, certainly, right? Um, I I, uh, I could go on, but I'm gonna I'm gonna move move us along as I talk about um, inclusive theater, anti-racist theater. You know, like institutions of higher learning everywhere. George Mason is engaged in those difficult but necessary conversations, and uh, this guest artist series grew out of a desire to further those conversations uh, by developing more awareness of the ways in which underrepresentation of marginalized voices persist in the American theater and becoming more familiar with artists and scholars engaged in conversations for radical change, racial justice, cultivating more comfort and proficiency when talking about race, power, and privilege. Um, and when I speak about inclusive theater, I'll just say explicitly, um, I'm speaking about a theater that as much as possible, rectifies racial disparity, bolsters, centers the stories of women, members of queer community, disabled folk, other marginalized identities. Uh, and for some of us, of course, we traverse multiple identities. So that's a long-winded prelude to the next question, which is, um, I wonder if you can talk about uh, your identity, particularly in the queer community and how it's informed the stories that you choose to tell? Hmm. Um, well, uh, yeah, I mean, I, uh, I identify as, uh, as lesbian, as a dyke, um, uh, uh, I, I, you know, my uh, my partner Madeline George came up with a um, a definition of the of the word dyke, which is a, a person who has uh, no truck with patriarchy, and I uh, I like that a lot. Uh -huh. um, <laughs> and um, so I, I think I think one of the things that really, um, you know, when I talked about seeing split bridges, I think. Uh, one of the things that gave me that, that revolutionized my imaginative theater brain at that time was uh, that f feels to me fundamental, you know, as I progressed as a theater artist and a writer, it feels to me fundamental to m my sense of what theater is and what its power is. Yeah. Is that. Um, it uh, just it, that 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 it it fully owned its own uh, theatrical authority, its own authority of uh, uh, as a as uh, the place from which the world would be viewed, um, and then went from there. And I think, mm -hmm. um, and this. You know, up and I was just going to say, and of course, this had always happened, <laughs> but yes, yes. explicitly we put it forward. Yeah. Maybe that was part of the postmodern movement, right? To say, listen, <laughs> this is who I am. This is the lens through which I experience and see the world, and I'm unapologetic about it. Yeah, I think it's that, but I and I think that you know, I had, I feel like I had seen this you know, in my limited experience, but what I had seen, because it, it's what had, you know, the little that had been produced yeah. uh, in stages that I might have access to at that point was work. And I, and I feel like I, I see it now too, that says, I'm here too. I'm here too. I exist. I exist. I'm also here. 
Right. And right. then I was right. in the presence of this thing that didn't need to say that because it was obvious. Right. Did it? It. And I and I think um, that th there is a powerful, uh, fundamental difference between yelling at the powers that be, "I am here," and and just presuming holding, that yeah. you are the center and you are looking at the powers that be. Uh, and yes. I, I actually think that's, that that is it. the fundamental power yes. of theater. Yes. That, um, you know, I, I often, I often say, you know, I often ask students to think about who their primary relationship is with. Yeah. Because I think that because of the way theater is uh, made in this country or, you know, produced, theater artists start to think of their primary relationship as being with artistic directors, with granting organizations. Mm. Uh, and uh, with not-for-profit theaters with producers. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, but mm -hmm. our fundamental relationship is with the audience. Nice. And we are having um, as, um, you know, as uh, 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 Justin Simeon, the writer and creator of Dear White People, uh, I heard an interview with him where he said that, you know, uh, any good uh, writing, dramatic writing, is in a conversation with its time mm -hmm. uh mm -hmm. and um mm -hmm. and that conversation is is direct the 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 engagement with the audience should be direct and we get uh you know we get really turned around by the structures where uh uh we i mean i, I you know so just an institutional problem that institutions rise up to to support the work of artists and pretty quickly it gets turned around so all of us kind of feel like artists are there to fill the stages of the institutions that the artists are there for the institutions yeah yeah um and one of the greatest things for me about coming up at, at wow was that i really learned that i you know you don't need anybody to put on a play right you, you might need other people to make a living Right. But you don't you you, you right. don't need right. Right. I mean I think it's what makes artists potentially dangerous. Mm. It's why why theater people are potentially dangerous mm -hmm. because artists confer their own authority upon themselves. Artists yeah. do not need permission to say this is what the world looks like from where I stand. And right. this is the other thing that I you know that feels very important to me is that we often hear this thing, you know, we need black writers to write about uh, black people, we need women to write about women, we need trans people to write about trans people. Yes, yes, of course. But what I want to see is all of the people from all of those places tell me what the world looks like from where they stand. What does the right. world look like from right. where you stand? Right. That's how that's how any of us understand what the world looks like if all we get is the story of the world from one person's perspective it's so impoverishing mm. i love to that us. It's the sense of authority that sense of agency i love that um you already talked about some of the influences in your work obviously split bridges uh are there other mentors um in your in your world in your work and who would they be mm. So many, I mean, you know, so many people that I came up with, Holly Hughes, mm -hmm. Carmelita Tropicana, mm -hmm. um, uh, you know, I, uh, you know, the five lesbian brothers who are my uh, collaborators, but who really, um, you know, I, I had, I have a younger brother, but I didn't have sisters. And I feel like there's a way that uh, I believe that sisters can really, um, you know, sort of put you in your place in a positive way. And the, the, you know, the brothers really took me apart and put me back together in a kind of a great way. I think we all did that for each other in some way. Um, um, no. Go ahead, go ahead, I didn't mean to cut you off. Oh no, I, I think I had somebody else in my head, but I can't. Oh, well, Janine, Janine is, you know, one of the great collaborators yeah. and theatrical thinkers, yeah. Wonderful, and uh, by the way, Thanks for the heads up, Fun Home. The music is available on Spotify. I listened to it this past weekend, had a wonderful time. Um, since we have sort of taken a turn uh, and you brought up her name, I was going to ask you this later, but 
I'm really fascinated by the collaboration between a composer and a lyricist. And I wonder if you could talk a little bit about that process, what it entailed, what it looked like, anything. Uh, I think it's, it's, you know, like all collaborations, it's different from person to person. Sure. Janine, um, I think Janine, um, you know, she likes to work with playwrights. Yes. Uh, who she has a sense uh, will, you know, will be able to write lyrics. Um, and she is, I mean, she's just, a, she, she, she is, she has incredibly deep uh, knowledge of the music theater form, which is, you know, very, mysterious and complex and it can do so many things and it's weird weird ass you know every every great musical is just a weird piece of work there's nothing naturalistic about it you know it's just very strange and i really believe that yeah i i, I just really believe that it's just one of the greatest forms and you know whenever people say they hate musical theater i'm like nobody hates musical theater the people who say the most i hate musical theater it's like particularly people who are in theater it's like well what why are you in theater what was the play that you saw and they're like bye bye birdie you know <laughs> it's just like it, it does right, this thing right. but i i do feel like you know it, people love it so much that when it disappoints you um you know you just feel betrayed also you know there's it's just a just a almost all of it is just like just shockingly racist and sexist you know so um Historically oh, speaking, there is that. Yeah, yeah. Historically speaking, there yeah. is that. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, there is that. There is that. Um, but uh, anyway, so um, I mean, Fun Home was a really difficult adaptation. Really, really formally difficult adaptation. How did How did the project come to you? So was it was um... It was brought to me by uh, some uh, producers who. Um, uh, were, had optioned the book and they asked me if I would be interested in doing it. And, you know, I, as I say, you know, it's, I felt in sort of intuitively like it could be a musical, but I had never written a musical before and I really could have been wrong. Mm -hmm. I think the reason it, it, it was a good thing to turn around is that it's filled with yearning. It's yeah. filled with inarticulable learn yearning. And I think that is where music, uh, that's a thing that musicals communicate. And, right. and it has life and death stakes. I think all good musicals have life and death stakes. Yeah, so. yeah. Mm. Um, I, I guess I'm wondering, uh, you've had um, a wonderful, I think, in my eyes, an idyllic sort of career because you've done experimental, you've done commercial theater, you've done straight on dramas, you've done dramedies, which are my favorite, <laughs> and you've done now musicals. And is there a specific moment within that trajectory of your career that really sort of reverberates as one of the most impactful? I know it's a crazy question, um, but I always, uh, I'm curious about turning points for any mm. artist. Yeah. Um, I mean, I would say number one would be going to well. That would be number one. That's the foundation for everything. Uh -huh. That's the foundation for everything. Uh -huh. And I think that really, uh, and when I went there, I mean, I, you know, I often say that my time, I just had the absolutely perfect timing. Yeah. This because, was 19, 1984. Is that what you said? Yeah, I probably went to WOW and like, you probably got there in, I think, 85, 86, something like that. Okay. And um, is I was WOW an acronym for? Um, for uh, Women's One World, I think it's, yeah. Okay. Um, it. And uh, that, so I would say that, is the most important thing that happened to me. Mm -hmm. um, because I, I think it taught me, I mean, it's what I was saying a little bit before, that nobody, that nobody can stop me from doing theater. I can make theater. Yeah. 
I might not make my living doing it, but whether or not I make theater, of course I can make theater. Anybody can make theater. Yeah. And well, it also taught me about a relationship with an audience and an audience that had, um, you know, we, uh, there was a quote I uh, read many years ago from Peter Gomes, who was the, for a long time, he was the head uh, preacher at the Harvard Divinity School, a uh, uh, black gay uh, man. Uh, and um, in an article I read about him years ago, he just said this one thing that really stuck with me. And he said, um, culture is always being defined at the margins. The cut that, you know, the strikeage of culture is always at the margins. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And, you know, the plays at WOW were funny, sexy, weird, frivolous. You know, we just, we just yeah. put them up and took them down. We made them, we had budgets of, of like, you know, two hundred dollars, four hundred dollars. Right. Somebody would put up, or they, you know, they, you get somewhere and you then pay yourself back out of the box office, and they were literally made out of trash. Like literally, that's where the sets came from. Yeah. And I, you know, having you know done college theater, done this touring company, um, you know, I, I I sometimes tell the story of you know when I was in college and developing a feminist consciousness. And, you know, starting to see that these plays, you know, Robert Bridegroom, I was like, this is a play romanticizing a rape. This, this is, the, I have this sense that theater, there's something, there's some power here that matters to me. And I'm only seeing it used so far yeah. for the eradicate, you know, the the obliteration of huge swaths of people, including me. Hmm. And you know, we did my my senior spring. Uh, the play was Picnic. Yeah. Picnic by William Inge. I was like, ah, Rosemary, you know, the spinster, yeah. the sad spinster. This is my part. You know, this is a part yeah. for a lesbian, you know? And then I didn't get cast and I played this old lady. This is ah. like, you know, cross, cross <laughs> the stage and diagonals and say things like, I baked a lady Baltimore cake, you know? And that play is about, you know, how these women, their lives are empty until this man, this young man shows up and then they remember that they're alive, you know? Oh, God. And I... I remember, like I had this, in terms of turning points, I had this moment of sitting on my, you know, little single bed in a state of acute crisis, thinking I i don't know why, because I have so little experience of it, but I feel that there, like, you know, to put, that the, there's an energy, there's a current in the theater that is gonna be the animating energy of my life. Yes. And yet, how can it be when it all it does is this mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. uh and so to go to wow and see the the absolute opposite of that was um yeah was and and so and it wasn't just what I saw on stage, it was the current of electricity between what was on stage and the audience. This right, sense, this right, crackling right. sense of self-definition unfolding. And the plays I'm telling you were, uh, they were largely like, you know, genre plays. Like, you know, the plays that we did, sort of proto Five Lives Me Brothers plays, they were called Paradise Alley, Paradise Lost. You know, this was the thing, like you knew if you put some work, Dyke, uh, Lesbo, um, sapphic, something like that in right. the title, then you would get an audience. Right. There was right. nothing. There was nothing. There was nothing. <laughs> so you would get an audience and then it was just like rollicking. It was alive. It was the, you know, that sense that there is something more, there is something more that can happen in a theater. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, then, uh, then, um, Mm. And and that it involves an audience that there is something alive that happens between uh, what happens on stage and an audience. For me, it just uh, sort of weaves in your previous statement about 
who is your primary relationship with. Yes. You're, yes. You know, if you're telling a story. And also, I've been a firm believer that, listen, an audience comes into a theater to see reflections of themselves, if not directly or explicitly, some storyline or identity that they can relate to. So all of that makes perfect sense to me. Perfect sense. Yeah. I mean, I th I think that that is right. That is right. I, I think that audiences, if they're most engaged, come to come to step into a place that is yeah. a little bit unknown. Yes, yes. And together take steps yeah. into a place that's unknown. And and you know, I I would say that some of my greatest um, theatrical experiences have been you know, I, because I, I think that's absolutely right. We come, particularly if we don't exist in the culture. Right, there right. There is a crackling, amazing, and, you know, also, if you're doing it just for yourselves, then there's an irreverence to it. There is a humor to, you know what I mean? You you don't have, you don't have to role model anything. Right, You right. know what I mean? It's right. just like, it's just like down and dirty. Right. Um, hilarious. Uh, uh, you know, you, you don't have, you're, you're actually, when you're, you're not actually, at that point, I don't think doing the work of trying to get uh, the powers that be to do anything for you, you are making yourselves visible to yourselves in all your messiness and complexity. And that is, yes. you know, that is magic. Yes. That is magic. Yes. yes. And then there's another thing that happens, uh, which is we make ourselves visible to each other. Mm -hmm. And I think that is, uh, uh, you know, in in a more in more mainstream theaters in it, with diverse audiences, that is what is powerful, actually. Mm -hmm. And you know, uh, you know, a thing would happen to me, particularly in the you know in, in the first performances of Fun Home, that people would come up to me and they would say, "This, you know, straight people, they'd be so moved, and they would say, this story is so much bigger than a story about a lesbian," mm -hmm. and I would think, and I don't think I said this to anybody's face because I just didn't, <laughs> but, but what I would say, what I would think was, this is exactly the size of a story about a lesbian. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. What happened for you, the reason you are so moved is that you, for the first time, had the, uh, your vision opened and you were able to see that this butch lesbian in the role of protagonist is a fully uh, prismatic human being yes. who's capable yes. of reflecting your experience. Yes. You're, you, you got bigger, you got bigger. That's the size yes. that lesbians are because that's the size that people are. Yes. And I think that people want that. People yes. want to, um, yeah, I, I think this is an incredibly powerful uh, thing that yeah. that that theater can uh, does for people. I think people feel elated and they don't know why when they go to a show that shows them somebody not like them and 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 they can feel their own their own imaginative uh, experience of the whole world going forward to their whole lives is now expanded okay. yeah 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 mm -hmm. um i'm going to open to the audience even though i have uh, i could talk to you all afternoon it's been a minute since we've seen each other um yeah, that's true. <laughs> uh, so at this point i invite you all to shift to gallery view and turn your cameras on if you feel comfortable doing so uh this is about building community i'd love to see as many faces as possible uh, and just remain muted until you speak. I will try to acknowledge either a virtual hand or real hand. If you have questions or comments for Lisa, uh, please feel free to jump in. It's great to see so many of you here. And crickets. We got crickets, Lisa. Yeah. <laughs> There's our beloved Dean, Rick Davis. Hi. Hi. Uh, I, this is uh, this is just this is an appreciation uh, of a really important thing that 
you said, Lisa, just a, a minute ago, I think, uh, at least I think it's important. And that is the idea that we come to the theater to to get bigger. I think that's so important because I think there's a there's a countervailing strain in our in our culture that says, no, every, everything has to be equal, equivalent. You know, we, we come to see the mirror, you know, and all that all that stuff. And I think the mirror, you know, is a limiting concept, you know, uh, unless it's a distorting mirror, and then and even even a distorting mirror is, is a mirror. So, but I I love to go to the theater and grow and and be challenged, whether I'm whether I'm doing the play or or seeing the play. And so I just think I just wanted to take a moment to underscore that because I so appreciate that thought. That's great, thank you. I agree. I agree. Um, Maybe uh, until we have other comments or questions, Lisa, you could talk a little bit about um, Save Our States, the work you're doing with them to shift the balance of power in state legislatures. What do you, what do you mean by that? What is that work? Oh, sure. Uh, well, um, uh, as it turns out, um, you know, as they say in the States Project, state ledge is not where the glamour is, it's where the power is. Mm. And, uh, you know, uh, what has what's happening now politically? Um, the driver of that, you know, the sort of nuts and bolts driver of that is that for 50 years, um, the Republicans were focused on state ledge, um, uh, on 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 building power in state legislatures, hmm. and the Democrats were not. Were not, and as it turns out, um, as we know now. Uh, the the uh, almost everything that matters to us is actually controlled by the states, um, healthcare, education, um, environmental laws, voting rights, uh, obviously, um, uh, uh, LGBTQ rights, uh, you know, uh, many different uh, employment uh, uh, laws and regulations. Um, and uh, I, actually I said healthcare, how we get our healthcare. Yeah. Um, and um, so, uh, so Republicans ha and they're the, they're also the you know they've been um, these laboratories of policy. So um, you know what what becomes the national agenda is generated from the states. Um, and uh, so after 2016, um, I, I obviously also there have been many people, um, you know, always working on the ground um, to, you know, paying attention to local governments, uh, paying attention to, um, you know, voting access, uh, getting people um, uh, to the polls. Um, they have had no um, national support, no consistent financial uh, support for that. Mm -hmm. um, and um, so in 2016, uh, Daniel Squadron, who was a state legislator in New York State, um, decided to turn his attention to um, getting, uh, you know, really focusing on uh, majority making um, creating you know majorities in state legislatures and um if you go to states uh st the states project uh dot org i think i can put it in the chat um you can see the work that they do um what we do uh, me and a bunch of different uh, uh theater people um the work is um supported by giving circles um, these are just groups of uh, friends who get together and raise money. We re raise money in every single cycle. Um, we set a goal for how much we're going to raise. And then that money goes right to the states. We try to raise early money that helps, um, uh, you know, uh, build foundations for campaigns. You know, early money is the most valuable money. Okay. Um, and uh, a couple of things I really love about the giving circles. One is that we raise money together. So we'll set a goal. Uh, there's sort of a core group of us uh, who are, you know, uh, keep the thing going. And then everybody who gives money is in the giving circle. Everybody gives as much as they can. We raise that money together. So if 
what you can give, the most you can give is, you know, $25 and this person can give $10,000. Everybody has given an equal amount. We raise that money together. We, we, we um, create that power together. I really love that about it. Um, and the other thing is that because we're giving this money to these candidates, their primary relationship can be with their voters, not with their donors. And that is also huge uh, to do that. And also by committing to give in every cycle from now until forever, uh, we can continue to, to, uh, to build. And uh, you know, this is a thing that has undermined um, the, you know, just the valiant work of people on the ground for years is the, you know, the, dis the disappearing of resources, the fickleness of, um, you know, our attention turns to, um, you know, these high profile, these high profile races, and then we and then we disappear, and we can't build uh, power over over time, which is what the Republicans were really, really good at doing. And if we do that, we can win because the Republicans aren't representing the interests of people and the democrats haven't been in a lot of ways either that's the other reason that it's important to have these alternate funding um sources uh but th what happened the really surprise of those midterm elections that was powered in the states that was powered right. by right. the support of state ledge that was powered from the bottom up um and the more i think uh you know huh. democrats progressives people on the coasts can start to, um, you know, turn our way, you know, just stop being dazzled by the, by personalities, by these, you know, mm -hmm. uh, marquee races, you know, mm -hmm. and uh, invest in these fundamentals. You know, I can't, I can't, I, I can't remember what the amount of money that people gave to Beto O'Rourke. I, I think Beto's great, great, you know, but that amount of money, you, you, a fraction of that can flip a state, can flip an entire state. Mm -hmm. So, you know, for us, for, you know, one of the things that we're doing in our giving circuit is trying to spread, spread the word about where, what is the, the thing we were able to say, we're able to say in every race is that it's the rare occasion where the money that you give, you can actually see the results. You can, your personal money, your yeah, personal money can flip a state race. Right. So it's very gratifying in that way. Thank you. Thank you. The questions, comments. Yes, Mac. I'm not sure how to phrase this question exactly. Uh, I'm, I'm like you. I didn't see a professional play until I was 23 years old. Uh, and my association with theater has always been in the audience. And my knowledge of theater didn't really grow until I started being associated with George Mason and the faculty and the students there. So in my experience or my education, theater has always been open and welcoming and uh, diverse. And your story about your experience when you started out struck me as just the opposite of what I thought theater was. Is it, was it really that way or was it just that way in that part of the country? Um, it was really that way. And I would say in many, uh, in, in many ways, it's still in, that in, way. In many parts of the country, yes. And, and certainly. Yes. Yeah. And I think, um, uh, a really uh, useful thing that's happened in a, and a, um, a kind of a game changing thing that happened uh, in the past decade is the count, which uh, uh, is a study that has been done, I think mostly every year by the, um, the Lilly Foundation. Um, uh, it was kind of the brainchild of uh, Julia Jordan, um, and and it's been done in collaboration with the Dramatists Guild. And what the count is is uh, an actual study, an a, an actual uh, um, uh, data on how how many plays uh, it was originally uh, plays written by women, 
and there were sort of criteria so that you could you could tell you know it sort of took out the classics it was new plays and it was at stages uh, of a certain uh size so in um you know professional productions across the country uh plays by women and then um uh then they started to do um a breakdown by race and ethnicity also which of course is I mean, gender is not clear cut and race and eth ethnicity is even less clear cut, uh, but they, you know, have figured out ways to um, look at those numbers. And uh, it was really helpful because for many, many, many years, uh, playwrights had been saying there is a, there only one type of playwright is being produced. And uh, until those numbers really, showed that this was not a feeling. This was an actual fact and the numbers were quite stark and they were uh, very, very helpful. So I think we have, like with many things, we have a kind of mythology based, an aspirational mythology. I would say a beautifully aspirational mythology of inclusiveness in the theater that is just not borne out by, uh, an actual look at uh, how resources are being allocated, where productions uh, are, you know, yeah, who who who's produced. You know, I I I I often say to playwrights, um, you know, when the question uh, comes up, uh, you know, uh, am I allowed? Am I allowed as a white person? Am I allowed as a man to write X, Y, or Z? And the answer is. You can, nobody is stopping you from writing anything that you want. Literally, I don't think anybody cares what another person writes. What people care about is what gets produced. What people care about is where the resources go. Um, uh, so, uh, you know, I would say I, I grew up in a, I grew up in a place where I had a certain awareness uh, of uh, structural racism, particularly as it applied to sort of housing uh, and uh, you know, sort of government resources, as, as it applied to my neighborhood. Yeah, health, all that stuff. Yeah, and um, and throughout my life, I have had these kind of moments where. I've had another moment of being like, oh my God, like, what didn't I see? Like, I real, I, you know, what you're describing, that thing of being like, wow, I've had this picture that things are like this, but really, I, I'm getting the sense that it's not like that. I really, really identify with that. It's happened to me so many times, and it happened in a huge way after 2016, where, you know, all of a sudden I would look around and I realized how many times in my theater life I was sitting in all white rooms. Mm. Mm -hmm. And I, you know, mm -hmm. I, these are not things that I didn't give, you know, in the, in one sense that I, I, I was not cognizant of, that I wasn't actively sort of thinking about. And yet, how did I not know? How did I not see that? How did I not see it? Um, you know, the, the sense uh, that there's a natural order to things, you know, it's, it's really, Right, right, right. Many forces, uh, you know, conspire to. And that sort of to speaks to the, the sort of insidiousness of racism too, right? That some of us have had the privilege of not thinking about it, not recognizing it when we walk into a room, um, or as a person of color, accepting it as a norm. But thankfully, I think we're beyond that point. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. Lisa, if you had to offer um, a strategy for creating, building anti racist, inclusive theater, what might that be? Well, it really depends on. Uh, and, and who you're directing that to. Um, oh, well, I, I guess, I um, and I, I don't know if you're teaching uh, right now that I know you have been. I guess I'm speaking specifically about the academy 
since that's mm -hmm. where this conversation is taking place. And and as I as I open today's conversation by saying we've been engaged in this conversation um, for a bit, um, I feel like the nation has sort of been at a tipping point. I do have this fear that as we move further away from that tipping point, i.e. the murder of George Floyd and all the things that happened during that time, my fear is that the people who have been really actively engaged in this resistance towards erasure, as you talk about, um, you know, some of us are saying, hey, I exist, I exist, I exist. My fear is that once the conversation, once the creation of this more inclusive theater is no longer in vogue, right, we slip back into an acceptance of something else. Mm -hmm. uh, that's, you know, that's my fear. It's it's sort of a, a fear that I've talked to a few, a uh, few colleagues about and certainly other friends. So. So let's let's focus on the academy, if you were to offer a strategy for. Sort of building more inclusive theater, what might that be? Um, well, um, I, I asked you to, to, to ask me where to focus and now I'm now I'm not going to. Uh, no, I'm going to focus on where <laughs> I'm not in the academy, and I don't really know about. That's it. okay. It's theater. We can improvise too. It's all yeah. Right. Um, I think that I've been thinking a lot about um, the damage uh, that are not for profit uh structure has done um really a, a, across the board politically um and and to our you know when i when i when i when I, i'm in various conversations about this at the drama guild with sometimes with students with playwrights and the focus on the theater institutions to provide solutions seems to me um a little bit heartbreaking a little bit heartbreaking um I, I i think that um and you know there's you know a lot of conversation about this if you you know read the book winner take all um by anand Jared. he's got so many syllables and i i i i, I memorize how to pronounce his name and then i apologize for not quite getting it right uh, okay. Okay. Harder, I think. Yes. Uh, anyway, it's an incredible book, winner take all. Um, uh, and um, uh, it, they, they, you know, sort of across the board, they've they've sapped away um, our ability to analyze power structures um, uh, and to think politically. I think so. You know, when I see people you know, looking to theater people, looking to uh, not-for-profit theaters to provide health insurance. It's just never going to happen. It's, it, it's not how it works or, or, or even the, you know, the, the unions, they don't, in the, in the, you know, the various theater unions, they don't provide everybody health insurance. They cannot do it. To me, what would be the great, um, uh, the great shift is, I think that everyone who really cares about artists should be pushing for universal health care. Mm. Can you imagine what would happen to our field with universal health care? Can you imagine? Right, right. I mean, right now in an equity contract, you, you know, you have a show that's like doing well, but in order to move it, you have to have this huge jump. And what is the number in that huge jump? It's health insurance. Yeah. Yeah. Um, if we had universal health insurance, universal child care, uh, relief from educational debt, because the fact is th that would transform everything. And that, you know, the fact is that as there was this amazing thing happened uh, uh, that was happening at the Wow Cafe that nobody could see, all across this country, there is theater that is speaking to this time that is alive and crackling and, and you know, opening something new. 
that we don't know about. It's all over. And if there, there were fundamental uh, supports for us to live a basic, a just baseline existence, so we could have housing, know we could eat, and know that we could go to the doctor if we needed to go to, know that somebody could take care of our kids or they could go to school. Then yeah. those artists would rise up. Then they could make their work. Not having some foundation, some not-for-profit, choose and lift one or two who will inevitably be serving the interests of those institutions, meaning of their donors mm -hmm. in some in some way. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, I think that that to 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 though that would shift things uh incredibly, but there has to be right. some cultural shift and paradigm and the appreciation of artists and and what we do and and our role but there, culture maybe but the, but there yeah. but but does there i mean if if, if artists so. are able to support themselves then artists can you know then then artists can make themselves inevitable do you know yes i hear what you're saying but if if we're talking about because what you're suggesting is legislation in essence right if uh you're yeah, talking, a shift in a yeah, shift yeah. in uh right right which in in my mind at least uh would only happen if there's a cultural shift and appreciation of what we as artists do but except it's not just for artists it's for everybody you know i think that yeah, cultural shift yeah, is happening yeah, yeah, that cultural yeah, shift but, is happening now but we're talking specifically about theater artists so that's yeah yeah I, so so i guess what i'm saying is I, I feel like we don't exist in a vacuum right <laughs> we, we don't exist in a vacuum yeah and and to have that kind of integration that kind of actual integration into people's daily lives it, you know so that you know so that art yeah you know art can be made it it, it is made everywhere you know it is made everywhere i think uh, we're, I think it, we're saying the same thing but yeah yeah, yeah. Um, other comments, questions? I have a comment. Okay, go on. <laughs> on the woman. Yeah. And Joe? Um, I'm a Tennessean by birth. I've lived in a number of places on the, in the United States. I've traveled a, a, a bit and got, was glad to get back home. Um, and when you're glad to get back home to Tennessee, you're desperate. Uh, even now, to get back home to Tennessee is desperate. I'm now in Massachusetts, where everything is done with making sure you have a linen napkin, napkin to put on your lap and that you have a finger bowl to wash your fingers in. In other words, just carefully done, done with the etiquette of ancient, ancient times. There is no inclusion to speak of, and yet we must speak of the inclusion that is. Because if we fail to acknowledge the inclusion that is, then we don't advance at all. Um, so I am frustrated with this conversation and Lisa, let me just say this. I loved, I loved reading Fun House, uh, the piece that got you wonderful Tony Awards. But it still was in the framework of separation. Mm. Not intentionally, not intentionally. And but mm. even for the people that it intent that it that it it sort of set in context, women could not speak. If you were gay, you could not show it. If you showed it, then you were extraordinary. Let me give you an award. Now we do not have to worry about you. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. These are the things that you have to tiptoe around when you go to talk about cultural change. Now, I don't know 
there, there is a strategy. I suspect that Jola is taking a number of strategies that people are offering and will find within that, that, that uh, conglomerate of things strategies that work, but we have to have all kinds of strategies to go in. I'm mm. not, I am not, I am a lay theater person. I have no cards or any of that. God gave me a lot of talent. I'm good when you put me on stage and I'm doing something that I like to do. I like being good at it and I make no apologies for it. But I do observe, observe, observe. And that's mm -hmm. the one thing we all have to do. And then when we do, we have to speak. Mm -hmm. This has been way too quiet because in the context of academia in Virginia, mm -hmm. where every 1619 got its start, mm -hmm. that has to be part of the context of making any cultural change. And white people yeah. do what uh, black folks are still doing. We still are trying to explain ourselves to, to the nth degree who we are, what we like. Don't you love us? We love you. White folks are going, well, yes. Yes, yes. <laughs> uh, but those are the things, that's the flip thing that has to happen. As far as getting the insurance and things like that, I believe that our, our audiences will advocate for us so that we are not having to do all of the uh, advocating for ourselves. And so I, I, my, 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 my noun, pronouns, all that is we, us, our. That's what it is. Every time you do a solo piece standing in the midst of making activism work for you and you don't have we, us, our in there, then you are also replicating what keeps us oppressed, singularity, individuality. And Jola is trying to move that so that there is an ensemble kind of basic strategy that whatever it is, all of our ideas come in. There's a circle and not a rectangle or a triangle. And that's what I believe should be uh, focused on at all times in any discussion of, of making cultural change because white folks have got to change, black folks got to change, everybody else under all of God's children got to change. <laughs> Hello. So I just say that and say that Lisa Crone, in my change, I want to have some of you in it. And I really am glad that you do the work you do. But today I kind of felt like you were walking on rice paper and you had on spike heels. Mm. <laughs> okay. I love you. <laughs> <laughs> uh, um, there are some interesting uh, comments in the chat. Those of you who want to look. Um, Elena responded directly to Owner Wumi, something you said about Massachusetts and Western Massachusetts, but I think it relates in a broader sense to this conversation, right? About strategies and yeah, as I said, I, I still believe we're at we're at a tipping point. We can make some different, mm -hmm. we can make some different choices now, right? And I I am um I am keeping my foot on the gas pedal because I want us to make different choices. I'm sick of the old yeah. ones. And Onawumi brings um, one of my own feelings to the floor, which is I'm sick of explaining, sick of not being, you know, just I, just, I just am, which relates back to what you said at the top of our conversation is just, it's like, we exist, we exist, get over it, let's move on. You know, 2050 is around the corner when, we will be the global majority. And how are we supporting the energy, the stories, the narratives, the relationships that represent what that global majority looks like, right? Yeah. Not yeah. only in professional venues, but in academia, in churches, in the grocery store, all those places. Um, 
I saw Joe, I saw your hand up and then I see Elena, your hand. So I'll go to you first, Joe. Sure, Lisa, I've so enjoyed uh, you speaking about all these very important issues. Um, I have a very specific question for you. I'm a music director with the School of Theater and we recently performed your Ring of Keys from um, Fun Home in a cabaret. And um, it came towards the end of the cabaret. It was surrounded by some big production numbers, but it was so poignant. I loved playing it every night. Um, it was so theatrical. It was so um, personal in the way it reflected this young Smalls, I think is the character's name, um, feelings. And it was clearly moving because of the way you structured the lyrics. Um, and I was just wondering if you could share more with us about how that particular song came together for you. I can, I can. Um, I just, I, before I do that, I just want to uh, thank you, Ms. Onawami, for uh, your comments. Uh, I, I'm, I, do, I don't, I don't, I'm not entirely sure that I, that, that this is ad addressing them, but I, I do feel that the problem of racism is uh, that it's a universal problem. And, uh, you know, a thinker that I really like, Eric Ward, um, you know, talks a lot about the importance of feeling like you have skin in the game, that, that you, you don't, that, that if you believe that, yeah, that you have skin in the game, that you will care about these things uh, more than if you then it's something that you observe and I definitely feel like um, you know racism takes a material toll uh, on people of color that it doesn't take on white people um, and then all the things that go along with that it takes a it takes a it's it takes a a spiritual toll on white people. It 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 it's a it's a you know it's living in a in a with blinders on. It's it's living uh, it's living in a in an arid box, um, uh, and um, I think it affects us as people and it affects us as artists, and I think it's it's urgent. So uh, I, f I feel it to be so in that way. I, I feel like we're, it's, it's something that we're in together with vastly different effects, but it's something we're in together that is killing us all in different ways. Um, so I thank you for uh, your comments. Um, Ring of Keys. Um, uh, yeah, I mean, I was afraid to write that song. Uh, Janine really wanted to write that song and I was afraid to write it because, you know, the, the image of uh, a butch is a comic trope, is a mean comic trope that, um, you know, there are a number of Broadway shows, musicals I can mention that have, um, uh, like there's, I can't remember which one it is, but at some point somebody just randomly yells the word lesbian to get a laugh, you know, or you would have some like, you know, coded lesbian, some gym teacher, you know, just cross the stage and yell, I'm so lonely, you know, just like, it's, it's just like, you don't even need to do anything. That trope is just, you know, it's, it's an image that has, I mean, I think it's changed some, but, you know, just automatic laughs. And I just, you know, from the time I started working on Fun Home, I was like, how am I going to represent this person without triggering that set of uh, dismissive um, associations. And so I was really scared to write it. And in her amazing way, Janine was like, well, okay, but we're writing it. And then, you know, I just thought about, you know, as I do when I, I'm like, okay, if I, if I put myself inside that character's mind at that moment, I, I wanna see what, where is her attention going? What is she thinking about? And so I just thought of what is she seeing when she sees this person? And then as I did that, I was like, all right, so I can't say combat boots because that sounds like that thing. Like what, how, I can't, you know, what, how do I describe these things that are true and particular, but don't trigger 
that set of, uh, you know, dismissive stereotypes. So lace up boots, um, you know, dungarees, things like that, that are, the song with you the know, song feel song like song. something that kid would really say, right? You right. know, avoid that thing. So it feels new. It feels, it feels like you're also seeing something you've never seen, you know, through her eyes. And then, you know, sort of thinking again about that thing of, you know, who's at the center of the universe. I think that when one of the paths that people fall into when they write about people other than themselves, particularly when they write about marginalized groups, is to depict that, that character only in relationship to the main character. Yes, yes. So a, a, way, that, a, a way that, for instance, um, you know, assumptions that people would have about this gay character coming out uh, uh, who hadn't had that experience is the first emotions that would come up would be shame. The first emotions that would come up would be sadness over what your life's not gonna be. When in fact, when you come out, the experience, the first thing that comes up is joy. Yeah. It's joy. Yeah. And I was gonna and say so, that, that lyric, I feel, when it's, uh, it's, it's curiosity, it's joy. You said it, joy. It's yeah. Joy. And, yeah. I, and I think the, the, the lyric that, I, that I, I feel proudest of or that means the most to me in that song is when she says, how can everybody not see how beautiful you are? But she can't, yeah. Yeah. it's not like she doesn't feel scared for her. She doesn't feel protective of her. She's just looking around like, why? What's it? And people, do you see what I'm seeing? Do you see it? <laughs> like it's yeah. just self-evident to her. Yeah. How this is yeah. the most wonderful thing in the world. So that's what it's I was thinking. It's beautiful. In. Thank you. Thank you for writing it. Thank you. Thank you. We're um, running out of time, but Elena, you had your hand up a moment ago. I actually dropped it in the chat because I have to run. I have an interview okay. that I have to do for a show that just opened. Okay. Um, but my thing I'm just going to offer, and I dropped in the space, is that I think one of the key things is that it's positional power, right? Yes. Our voices are out there creating things, and they have been. They've been creating things for a long time. People just didn't want yes, to listen. Yes. But right. my one comment before, uh, you know, about M Michael Bobbitt, who is in positional power and shifting the paradigm in Massachusetts, mm -hmm. and it's taking time, but it's happening. Where funding is getting opened up, so we're not just getting funding to large old institutions, but we're getting it to the drag queens. We're getting it to the non quote, you know, the artists that haven't been recognized. We're getting it to the solo artists. We're getting it to the tattoo artists. We're like, it was amazing talking to him recently. He's a friend of mine. So we just, we had a chat recently mm -hmm. and that is part of it. Seeing mm -hmm. Jola here in that, you know, position chair, that's going to change it in academia. We just, that's what needs to happen. Positional power, yeah. and then but galvanizing behind. Agreed those leaders yeah so. thank you thank, thank you for you. your time i'm so sorry that i have to run thank you all, all right it's Peace. great to see you thank you thank you, thank you. Bye. any uh other thoughts comments we are running up on time as usual oh <laughs> on a woman i can't tell that your hand up or you're applauding <laughs> I'm trying to applaud. Whenever I start that, I usually screw. <laughs> I've got an I've got an X up there, and that's exactly what I don't want up there. But hello, you know. All right. Well, that's all right. Thank you, Lisa. It's more more than a pleasure, really, really. Um. Um, I had one last question, actually. Um. I've taught, I've taught your work. I've taught uh, well. I've taught 2.5 minute ride um, for a while now. And one of the consistent challenges is getting students to embody characters inspired by autobiographical experience, you mm -hmm. know, and to embody characters with the same name as the playwright. Uh, mm -hmm. And so no matter how much I assure them that Lisa, the character, is a theatrical invention. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Some students cannot accept the responsibility of embodying you. Um, how do you feel about that? And what would you say to those students? Well, um, 
Yeah, I mean, <laughs> um, when we did, uh, we're doing well at the public. Um, this, uh, uh, Jane and I did a talk, Jane Howdyshell, who played my mother, yes. the brilliant yes. Jane Howdyshell, a woman, um, there was a talk back and a woman was very kind of, well, maybe I won't tell that story. That's a kind of funny story. But uh, one of the things that somebody said to me was, you should really listen to what that character K says in that monologue. Uh -huh. And I said, well, I, I wrote that monologue. <laughs> um, and I, you know, it, yeah. when I would show the script to my mother as I was working on it, which was, you know, was a real uh, journey for the two of us. Yes. You know, she yes. loved the play ultimately, but the writing of it was harrowing for her. And, you know, I, I would say to her, you know, she was responding to my character as if I would say, mom, are you just reading my lines and your lines? Like, you have to read the whole play. I am the whole play. Um, and, you know, it was one of the challenges of writing it was, you know, that this character had to be clueless in certain ways, not that I'm not also clueless in many ways, but, you know, I had to let the, I had to, I mean, sort of my definition of a theatrical character is that the play has to know more than the character. Right, right, right. So, so yeah, the, so the, the character, I am the play, the play. The character is a construct that I made to explore the questions that I, the playwright, wanted to explore. And, and also, you know, I mean, I remember people would also say to me, you know, they, they'd say to Jane, you were so incredible, which she was, she was incredible. And then they would say, you were just being yourself. And I would think, what happened in that play? Like, what just, yeah. nothing, everything in that play was made up. It's, it, it's it was all... Those are like made, made up things that happened. It's a leap. It's a leap that uh, I often find, you know, having written a lot of autobiographical work myself, it's a leap that many audience members can't take. It's like that representation of me that you see on stage is not me. It's a character that I've created. Yeah. Yes. Amplifying <laughs> some of my own characteristics diminishing right. others and anyway right. there is a craft in that which I know we could talk longer about but um and I think in well in particular like there are things that happen you know there yeah. are things to play that are things that happen which are that I brought my mother on stage she doesn't do what I want her to do the actors yeah. quit I yeah. have to yeah. you know it there it's it's a it's a wonderful there's nothing realistic happens in the play. <laughs> it feels like it is, but it's not. So, yeah. so in that way, the idea that it's just me, the person, it's it's a theatrical like made up things happen in the play to this yeah. to this person based on some yeah. things about me. I get it. I get it. Thank you. Um, and uh, we'll have to keep talking, Lisa. I really enjoyed our conversation right. today. Thank you. Um, many thanks to our George Mason School of Theater, Mason Players, Players for Change, Friends of Theater, and CVPA's Office of Marketing and Communication for all of their support in publicizing this event. A special shout out to our program manager, Nick, who's been working tirelessly behind the scenes and got us all in here today. Um, all of our discussions, including those from previous artists and scholars, are on our website. And um, again, eternal thanks to Lisa Crone for being with us today. Beyond a pleasure, thank you for attending, all of you. Be well, be safe, and whenever possible, be joyous. Till next time, take care. <laughs> Bye, everybody. Thank you. Thank sure. you. Bye.